Hello. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Carnegie Institution for Science. My name is Dion Rossiter, and I am the Scientific Programs and Outreach Manager here at Carnegie. On behalf of our president, Matthew Scott, I would like to welcome you to our beautiful auditorium, this beautiful building, for this special screening of NOVA's Life's, Life's Rocky Start. As an earth and planetary scientist myself, I am actually very excited about tonight's program. The film follows Earth's evolution from a fiery, inhabitable state to the Earth we know of today. And in the film, Bob Hazen, who's a Carnegie scientist at the Geophysical Laboratory here in Washington, DC, leads us through this exciting tale. As you'll see tonight, Dr. Hazen is a master at conveying scientific information to the general public. And as an advocate for science outreach and education, Carnegie Institution for Science is incredibly thankful to NOVA for creating this beautiful, captivating, and scientifically informative film, which I'm sure you'll all love. In addition, we are incredibly happy to welcome NOVA back to our auditorium for a second time after partnering with us just over a month ago. Um, we would especially like to thank Paula Absel, who is the senior executive producer at NOVA and the director of the Sci science unit at WGBH. Paula will introduce Life's Rocky Start, and she will moderate the panel and Q&A after the film. I'd like to thank NOVA once again and Paula, and please welcome her to the stage. So anyway, thank you very much, Dee. And we're delighted to be here in this beautiful theater. So in a sense, this show began several decades ago when Bob Hazen first became a scientific advisor to NOVA. And over the years, he's provided expert advice in any number of NOVA programs and has appeared in several. And we owe a real debt of gratitude to Bob, along with the many scientists from this institution and others who've kept NOVA alive and well for 43 years. And as anyone, thank you. So as many of you know, Bob is a gifted science communicator on the printed page and on screen. In addition to his contributions to NOVA as a science advisor, we talked for years about working together on a film about his research. And when Bob published his book, The Story of Earth, in 2012, we knew we'd found the right topic. In the book, Bob takes a radical new approach to the history of Earth, exploring the unexpected role rocks and minerals play in the origin of life. It's an epic story, one that took Bob and the producer of the film, Doug Hamilton, around the world to film. So please join us after the screening for a brief panel discussion and Q&A with Bob and my talented colleagues, Doug Hamilton and Julia Court, Deputy Executive Producer at NOVA, and you'll all have an opportunity to ask questions of the three of them and I hope you enjoy the film. Just as we start our panel discussion, I want to remind you all uh, something I didn't say before, which is that this show is actually on television, on PBS, next Wednesday night, January 13th at 9 p.m. So please tell all your friends and relations to watch, and we'd appreciate that very much. Additionally, at pbs.org slash NOVA, you'll find all kinds of additional materials, including educational materials for the classroom and for kids to do at home that will enrich their viewing of the program. So we'd really appreciate if you could spread the word. And now I'd like to um, introduce my fellow panelists. Um, Julia Court in the middle here has been at NOVA since 1991 and she's contributed to more than 80 films as producer, director, and writer. And in her current role as deputy executive producer, she oversaw the production of this film. And to Julia's right, um, Doug Hamilton is a veteran <laughs> TV journalist with 25 years experience reporting on a range of subjects 
for the PBS series Frontline and American Masters, as well as CBS News 60 Minutes. And he's been making films for Nova for at least a decade, and he wrote, produced, and directed Life's Rocky Start. And Bob Hazen, we spoke about before, and in addition to Bob's many scientific credentials and his prolific science writing, he recently retired after a 40-year career as a professional symphonic trumpeter, having performed with some of the world's greatest orchestras. And he is, as you can see, a man of many talents. And we are all very fortunate that he has chosen to devote so much of his life to science. So Bob, let's start with you and these questions. As a mineralogist and astrobiologist, you study rocks. And what motivated you, and, and when did this begin, to investigate the relationship between rocks and the origins of life, and then eventually write the book, The Story of Earth? Well, Paul, I don't know. I started um, collecting fossils in Cleveland, Ohio, when I was maybe seven or eight years old. I found my first trilobite when I was eight or nine. Uh, and then my parents moved me away from the fossiliferous areas of Ohio to northern New Jersey, which has very few fossils, but incredible mineral riches. There was an eighth grade science teacher who so inspired me, Bill Welch, who, who was a collector himself and pointed me out to some of the great localities, some of which were represented in the minerals that you filmed. I just love the, the fluorescent mineral from Franklin, New Jersey, which I visited with Margie um, uh, as, as a high school uh, student. And, and, and so this began me thinking about both fossils and rocks and I went to MIT, I decided I loved geology and learned more and more, but it took a long time before I integrated these ideas. Um, it really was a matter of stepping back from being a professional mineralogist to thinking more broadly about science education and how one communicates the whole range of sciences where biology and geology and astronomy and physics and chemistry are all part of a larger story and then the connections started to fall together. So something I'd like to know, were you at all worried as you began to make this link between rocks and life um, and really kind of bring together and integrate these ideas in, a, in a really an interdisciplinary way? Were you worried about the reaction from your scientific colleagues? And how have these ideas been received? Are they, are they very controversial? Well, maybe not worried, but I was aware of the fact that many of my colleagues thought of mineralogy as a strictly physics and chemistry discipline. My PhD advisor, who was a brilliant scientist, advised me when I had one elective to take left before I got my PhD. I said, there's this great biology course. He said, don't take biology. You'll, you're a mineralogist. You'll never use biology. <laughs> um, as a consequence, my last biology course was in eighth grade. Did you believe that? It's, it's incredible. So, um, so, <laughs> so I, I listened to him, and I took a quantum mechanics course, which I never used, <laughs> really. <laughs> but, but <laughs> It, it, is, it is amusing, um, but I think that uh, my colleagues in mineralogy recognize that there's a richness to understanding how biology and mineralogy are linked does not in any way negate the importance of physics and chemistry and understanding minerals as, as, as objects that, that, that have um, important properties, but it's given their history, and you can't understand the history of minerals uh, without biology. You go to the Smithsonian, you'll notice that there are gorgeous mineral specimens, but there are no dates, there are no ages on those minerals. That's amazing to me. I mean, every mineral has a story, it has a history, and yet we don't think of those. We isolate them from their story, and I'm trying to bring the stories back. So how has that been received? Is this, is this something that's gradually working its way into the, the kind of scientific lexicon? I've got some wonderful colleagues here in the audience who are working with me on this. and. Um, and Dan and Dimitri and Chow and, and, and others who, who um, I think are taking the rigorous expertise of the chemists and physicists who have studied minerals and applying these new ideas and seeing the hints of biology that are preserved that we really just hadn't noticed significantly before. And it's really exciting. It opens up new doors for all of us. So it's, it's, it's really just enriching the story that we've all been trying to tell. So Doug, let's go to you and tell us, as you're, you're confronted with all these new ideas, you have a book and uh, filled with very complex ideas, chemical ideas, all sorts of things, rocks, and I don't know if you, I don't think you had made a film 
on this topic area before. So what did you feel was the biggest storytelling challenge in adapting Bob's book into a one-hour film? And how did you come to the creative approach to the film? Oh, I think with most, most films I do, and certainly in this one, it, you know, I, I start off asking the most stupid questions to the smartest people I can find. <laughs> and it's through asking those questions and me trying to understand it that I ultimately come to how to tell the story. It's the people um, and the sequences that help me understand something that I really don't understand at the beginning, that I realize I have to bottle, I have to package that in some way for the viewer. Um, and it, it's always astonishing to me, I, you can talk to 10 of the most accomplished, smartest people around, but there are certain people that have a unique ability to communicate that, and that's hugely important for us in television to do it, and, the, and those are the moments where I get the, aha, oh, that's why it makes sense, and, and Bob, through you know, an incredible amount of patience on his part, <laughs> put up with that process, <laughs> and, and it led to um, sort of the distillation of these ideas. Um, you know, one thing I notice, in some ways there are two strains to the stories. One is the history of Earth with these colors, which happens to be, I mean, I just completely fell in love with that, that idea when, when, uh, when you described it to me. And the other is, of course, all this work on the, all these ideas on the relationship between minerals and life. And of course, they're interrelated, but they are in some ways two distinct stories. So when arriving with, on a, in a creative approach, I think they're beautifully integrated, but how'd you do that? Well, you guys helped a lot. <laughs> um, I mean, our process is, is such that um, Nova will hire, I'm an independent filmmaker, um, and we will, they'll sort of send me out to research um, for a period of time, and then I'll write up a treatment of what that, what I think the film will be, and then it's really interacting with Julia and Paula and, and wonderfully informed and, and um, uh, great storytellers that we over, you know, I mean this film basically was in production for a year, continue to hone in and sharpen the story. Um, and it is about weaving it. You know, the, the color phases is a very easily graspable idea. A lot of the elements here are, are difficult, they're new, they're challenging to people. And so we wanted, and I think Paula kept pushing for this, we wanted to give people um, a road map um, and we could keep coming back. We called it our anchor image, that image of the six color phases. And so, you know, we would, we would use that and then we'd go off literally around the world and we'd come back, um, you know, 12 minutes later and, you know, from a storytelling point of view, you have, you, you, you know where you are again and you feel ready to move on in some way. So. It, it takes a lot of work, and an incredibly talented group of people I work with, the editor Rob Tenworth, who cut this, is just an exquisite editor and, and gives it its, so much of its feel. Um, Bruce Liffetton, who is the cameraman who shot some of this, is sitting right here, he shot a lot of the stuff here at the Carnegie Institution. Um, so all of those factors come together. And, and the graphics, of course. And the graphic, Mitch Butler, who, who's a, a, a great, um, animator. He's just really good at explaining things. In fact, his company's name, Explano Graphics, <laughs> um, is, you know, is, uh, brings to life these things. I mean, our biggest problem here is this story, you know, tells a four and a half billion year history in 53 minutes, and there's not pictures of any of this stuff until, <laughs> you know, the last four seconds. So, so you have to figure out ways how you can explain it and, and visualize it. I know, too bad the Stromatolites didn't have cameras, really. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. No iPhones in those days. So, Julia, in, in essence, you were Nova's representative in this, in this whole process. We make maybe 20, 25 sometimes programs a year out of all the vast and many stories in science. And in that, in, in that sense, this is, is yours to choose that this would be one of those few programs that we, we actually do. So what were your concerns? I mean, a lot of people would think rocks are kind of boring. They don't talk. They don't really do that much. Um, 
what made you think that this would be interesting and what what kinds of emphasis did you really feel that we needed to bring to the film in order to make it appeal to a general audience, people who have no scientific background who watch our shows? Well, I think the thing, a word that you've heard repeated a lot here already is story. So what was appealing for us is that it's a great story. So the story of rocks and the evolution of the earth and of life together is intriguing. And as we, we, as Doug said, we had many discussions about the best way to weave the story and the best way to keep people engaged because, as you said, some of this science is very complicated. So this is what we do in NOVA all the time. We tell uh, and convey complicated science stories, but we do it through mystery and good storytelling. So what could be more fundamental or fascinating and intriguing than the origins of life? This is something that everybody thinks about. And to have this incredible evidence laid out in the earth and to be able to go to these incredible, beautiful places, uh, it's a natural. And you know, we fortunately have a great storyteller here, a great storyteller here, uh, and all these talented people incredible pictures. Uh, this was key to actually you know, drawing people in, keeping them engaged, showing them aspects of rocks that they've never seen before, never thought of before. Uh, all that, you know, I think, I hope, leads to an amazing viewing experience that's inspiring. So it was, it's one of those big questions, and those make great novas. So that wasn't hard at all. So Bob, you've been in many novas before, but this is really the first one we've made that's really focused on your work. So I wonder, did you have any trepidation? <laughs> in, I mean, I think this is, I, I have to give a lot of credit to, to the scientists um, who work with us and whose stories we tell, because after all, you have a professional reputation to uphold and you're giving it to you know a bunch of television producers. So I, I wonder what kind of feelings you had when you <laughs> handed it over. And we, by the way, we don't give our scientists editorial control. And the first time that Bob saw the film was when? Two days ago. <laughs> oh, and that is our, our, our normal process is that they actually don't see it till it's on the air. And so I, I wonder if you had any concerns about it. Well, first of all, I. I have had the privilege for more than 30 years working with Paula, and so I've seen the NOVA operation up close and personal for a long time, and it's the greatest science TV series on earth. It's just, it's a fabulous opportunity, yeah. yes. <laughs> and I think you can all imagine the thrill and honor it is for me to have someone take that kind of interest and give me the opportunity to tell a story that I'm passionate about. Um, the trepidation came mainly from the reactions that are inevitable from some of my colleagues who are either not featured as prominently as they might be because their science was integral to this story. Um, some of my colleagues whose images were there, but you know, they're not identified or, I mean, this is something you, for storytelling, you have to sort of have a narrative thrust. You also have to maybe focus on a few individuals because you can't have you know, 30 or 40 people. And so, so I always feel a little guilty because the impression may be that you know, these are just uniquely my ideas or this is my story, and that's not true at all. And I will say publicly that I am indebted to, to a dozen people in this room and a hundred people outside this room whose ideas I built on or who have amplified or were collaborators on all of this work. Um, you just can't show that in a public. So that was my main, and I expressed this to Doug many, many times, times. <laughs> and, 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 and he was very sympathetic, and I think that it really, um, as, as, as well as any show could do, I think it, it, it emphasized the science and not the individual, um, you know, who, who takes the credit for what. So it was, it was really beautifully done, elegantly done. I'd see it as a work of art that translates science uh, for, um, general audience, but also is just visually so inspiring. Um, the mineral 
images are just as spectacular as anything that's ever been produced in that realm. And as a mineralogist, that makes me very proud. Okay. So we, if you have any questions, you could line up behind. There's a mic there and a mic there. And while you're doing that, I will um, ask just one more question of uh, Bob and Doug. You traveled extensively for, uh, for this show, and I wondered, what were the places that you found most interesting, most useful, had the most fun? Were there any particular mishaps or adventures that you'd like to, uh, or that maybe you wouldn't like to tell us about? Well, what, you know, this started when um, Bob had a sabbatical semester two years ago, a year, year and a half ago, something yeah. like that, and had trips already planned to some of these places. So we actually were able to piggyback on some research he was doing, which allowed us to go to more places than we would have otherwise been able to, both in terms of Bob's schedule and, and um, our budget, um, really. But um, I've got to say, you know, Bob kept saying, you've got to come to Western Australia. And I've been to Australia, and I love it. But I didn't really understand till I got there and, got, and realized this is the oldest piece of Earth still on the surface of Earth. It's three and a half billion years old. And it's just mind-boggling to be there and, and to think of that. Um, I mean, you see it at a level that I don't, but just you know that, that concept and to pick up a rock that has some of the very first fossils, the first fossils, known fossils of life, is, is, is thrilling. You know? um, the other thing, though, the disappointing thing is I spent two weeks in Australia and I did not see until the last day for about <laughs> a half a second a kangaroo. <laughs> okay, I see we have a lot of questions. So I'm going to start, go right, left, right, left. So why don't we start here, sir? This is a question for Dr. Hayes, and we were here, uh, my 11-year-old daughter and I were here for your last appearance in this hall when you gave a presentation about two months ago on a very similar subject and you hinted that this movie was coming up and so on. Towards the end of that lecture, <clears throat> you uh, presented uh, some studies about terraform planets and the probabilities and the number of niches and, and uh, crevices and so on and you came up with a very, very huge number. You said, it was a, it was a quite a spectacular thing. You said there, there are these ten to the fifty seventh number of uh, of uh, places where uh, life can form on a terraformed planet like Earth, and it, it took me a couple months to and coming back here to think about it. It seemed like there was another page to your presentation that you you just didn't present that day, and it was something about uh, the inevitability uh, when you take some of the science that you can do in the lab and the math that you can run, uh, what's the, you know, are we coming up to a chapter in your work here uh, where we're going to be talking about the inevitability or the probability uh, that uh, life would not happen given these uh, conditions? And maybe you can help me phrase the question better than I am, because I, I think you probably know where I'm going with this. But uh, is there some other chapter that you're running up on? And instead of big numbers where we have the probability that life will occur in these, is there another number that's coming soon that said the probability that life wouldn't have happened in these conditions is? one in some big number. So the number that's going to change things is the number two. We know of one living planet. And I think the number that's going to change is that we're going to discover a second one. Maybe it will be in, in the next decade. Maybe it'll take 100 years. But we will discover another planet that's living. And once you know that it's not one, a unique planet Earth that's living, but there are two, then there's countless living planets. My statistics had to do with how difficult it would be in a laboratory to somehow reproduce every possible niche that an Earth-like planet provides, 10 to the 50th or 10 to the 60th different niches over a billion-year period. 
a laboratory scientist can't reproduce that many. But, but in fact, space, the cosmos can. And that's why I think it's going to be up to the astrobiologist to go out and find that second living world and therefore tell us that life is a cosmic imperative. Thank so, you. sir, over here, please try to keep your questions short because there are a lot of people who want to ask them and we'd like to get to all of you. Sir. Uh, my name's David. I've been interested in this topic for a long time. I'm delighted at this film. I would like to nominate it for the Academy Award <laughs> equivalent. <laughs> if there is, is there an Academy Award equivalent in the science film making? Well, you can win, and we can win an Emmy, and there are many other <laughs> awards. So, from uh, from your lips to the judges' ears, <laughs> <fears, laughs> that's all I can say. A uh, quick question for Dr. Hazen. You mentioned in passing that you can see chemical signatures of different events in Earth's history, including the impact that created the moon. And I was wondering, what signature is that, and how do you know? So the signature of the creation of the moon, and there are other people in this audience that are more expert on this than I am, has to do particularly with the chemical composition, and particularly the isotopic composition of the moon, which is so remarkably similar to Earth that the only way the Earth and Moon system could have formed as if they once were somehow mingled or commingled and, and merged. So, so there's a great deal of evidence. So it was not until we went to the Moon, brought back Moon rocks, and analyzed them that we saw that remarkable, astonishing similarity that leads to a co-genetic aspect. Over here. Thank you. Uh, actually, I have two questions, if I could. One for the producers and one for Dr. Hazen. Um, Dr. Hazen, if I were to go back in history and actually speak with, uh, say, Michael Faraday, and ask him to speculate on his work with electricity. Why is he tinkering with that? You know, he would probably have not been able to fathom our, how it became so foundational in modern life. Um, I guess in, in, in your study with mineralogy and, and, and all these uh, wonderful topics, um, how do you see that topic really being extended into so many different sciences, let's say, for instance, in health sciences and regenerative sciences and uh, communicable diseases? And, and do they play a part throughout all uh, all those different sciences. That would be my question to you. And as uh, to the producers, there seems to be this really interesting narrative that's coming out of modern science that really puts the human more in terms of a cosmological perspective, in terms of us being really more of a process of this huge 14 billion uh, year process versus this very anthropocentric type that we live in right now where everything's about us and it's about our needs and our wants. I guess the challenge that we seem to be having right now is how do we move from how we live now to what science has come to understand? And since you deliver that narrative to the public, I just wanted to see how your role is in that, in, into diffusing that greater narrative to, uh, to especially the next generation of kids coming out. So. Bob, you want to take it first while we can <laughs> yes. so, so I think that the literal interface between mineralogy and the other chemical sciences is exemplified by my colleagues Dimitri Svergensky and Jiwa Hao who are here. And we have a team that's studying the interaction of organic molecules onto mineral surfaces. This, this is happening in our bodies, it's happening in bones and teeth, it's happening in all kinds of natural environments as microbes interact with rocks. And I think it's that understanding that will lead to new technologies, that will lead to new understanding of this coevolution and perhaps the origin of life. Okay, you should, you well, uh, Julia, I mean, the, one, the one thought Be I was having, <laughs> I'm not sure if this answers your question, but I mean, we've, we have done, even in the last few years, we've done a lot of um, geology shows, and we just recently did a three-part series called Making North America, and it covers, it's about the, the making, construction, and the evolution of life on the continent. And like this film, it covers four and a half billion years of history. And uh, I think it's a testament to how fascinating and rich this history is that we were able to make three films there and this wonderful film here with not that much overlap. But I think that's one of the wonderful, one of the wonderful things about these films is that it gives everyone this perspective on us and our world, uh, you know, with the clock, you know, we are wonderful clock of the history of the Earth. What, what are we? Four seconds. Four seconds. In, in human. Four seconds. Yeah. And to see, 
you know, this incredible story, all the things that have happened um, before we even existed and things that had to happen in order for us to exist. And also this idea of the whole universe and how these processes work and what the possibilities are out there. Um, I think they're fascinating and intriguing things to think about. Thank you very much. This may be hopelessly complicated, but how do you date these things? Uh, and uh, is there agreement if you say that this rock is 350 billion or uh, uh, 3.5 billion years old? Do people generally agree on that? And how do you tell that one piece of zircon is 100 million years older than the next one? Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so th there, there are many techniques for, for dating materials, but primarily for the most ancient rocks and minerals, we look for radioactive isotopes that gradually decay like a ticking clock. And you have some of the original leftover, like uranium-238, but you also have some of the decay products like lead. Those zircon crystals, for example, that John Valley was looking at at the University of Wisconsin, they contain this clock. The uranium was part of the original crystal. Now some of that uranium is converted <coughs> to lead, and you can measure that ratio and determine the age of those crystals. I think that now for formations, for example, the Pilbara in Australia, Australia, the 3.5 billion year old rocks, it's universally agreed upon. In fact, they give this rock is 3.49, this one's 3.475, and this one's 3.463. I mean, that's the, that's the accuracy with which we can now date individual volcanic horizons or basalt layers. It's really quite remarkable. So there are certainly few areas in the world where there are big controversies because later heating, thermal events, and other sorts of changes have altered the rocks in ways that may skew the dates a little bit. But by and large, uh, for sediments, for the types of rocks that hold fossils, those ages are very, very well constrained now. Over here, please. Yes, I'm Dr. Sam Hancock of Emerald Planet, Emerald Planet TV, and this is a question for the three of you. Going uh, forward uh, 4.5 billion years to now, what are you seeing as we go to a planet of about 9 billion people by 2050, maybe 12 to 13 billion people by the end of the century? And what, are, what did you read out of all that research that may predict something as far as climate change and where we're going to be over the next... 50 to 100 years, and thank you for being here. That's a tough one. I, I, I want to know what color we will. That's my job. <laughs> figure that out. You can figure out what it's going to be. <laughs> uh, um, yes, uh, we, looking into the future is, of course, very important for us, thinking about um, not just millions of years in the future, but just, just centuries in the future. And I think the scientific community is pouring a huge amount of time, effort, and thought into that. There are um, very large uncertainties about some aspects, but the fact that we're having warmer Decembers in, in Washington, D.C. Is, is not debatable, and that's not just anecdotal. There's a, there's a pattern of increased temperature, which we have to think about, you know, what are the causes about that. So um, I'm not an expert in this area, and I don't want to make any scientific pronouncements, but I do think that the study of the future is extremely important, and one of the key ways of understanding what's going to happen in the future is to study the past, both the recent past and also the distant past. See how Earth operates as a planet. Earth has always changed. Earth is a planet of change. It will continue to change, and the question is to what extent do humans actually influence um, those changes as they come about. As a person who's not an expert at all, but a journalist, I, I, I see a lot of challenges ahead, as I, I, as I think we all do, and a lot of opportunities and need to make quality documentaries to help make people aware of the challenges we face and the tremendous work that's being done in science that can help us face the future and, and make it better for ourselves and for our fellow citizens of of this planet. So yeah. I, I think it gives us a lot of, although we may prefer not to have any problems, 
I think, though, that the rich scientific work gives us a tremendous opportunity to help raise public awareness. Well, thank you for being here and all your research. Thank you. Sir. I, I just want to commend uh, PBS and NOVA for this excellent documentary, which I'm sure will enrich the, everyone's knowledge and the interest in this field. Because as I know, as an immigrant 35 years ago when I came and I started watching, really made me more interested in this kind of a thing, led me to read more about it. And I'm sure this will, but this is, uh, keep producing more of that. And then about one question, to uh, in terms of uh, the planet, the life on planet extinction, the possible extinction after a cosmic collision or any such accident, what are the chances for the re-emergence of life on Earth from those amino acid soup in the interstellar space? I, I think that the idea that life on Earth could go extinct um, without some, some major change, for example, in the sun, which will happen a few billion years from now when the sun becomes a red giant and, and, and Earth becomes a blasted cinder. Don't worry, it's not going to happen <laughs> yeah, anytime soon. But, but in terms of near term, even a catastrophic collision with an asteroid is someplace that might challenge macroscopic life, the microbes are going to go on. I mean, there's no way, there's, there is an incredible deep microbial community. At any place you go, right here, if you drill the hole down a mile or two, there are living microbes down there that are really insulated from the surface. And our work with the Deep Carbon Observatory, which has one entire uh, international cohort studying deep life, this deep microbial life, it's astoundingly diverse and, and widespread anywhere you go deep underground. So that, that life will continue. It will go on for billions of years beyond uh, even if the surface life is challenged. Did you notice that fly that was on the <laughs> yes. screen? Oh, yes. I, yes. I, was, I was very gratified personally because it sat there for the entire <laughs> film. Uh, only when we started to talk did it fly off. <laughs> Sir, over here. Yeah, my name is Bill Jones. I'm not a scientist, but I've worked, uh, done a lot of work on uh, translating the work of, of Vladimir Vernadsky, who was a mineralogist and a biogeochemist and who's dealt with some of these uh, questions. And I think the film was very important and will be very useful uh, in uh, raising issues on this. I'm very glad that you didn't come with, to, with a definitive uh, answer to the origin of life. Uh, and you did indicate that the, the, the experiments that have been done in trying to produce life in the laboratory have not been very successful. Uh, and uh, ultimately, they may not be at all, since we, as Vernadsky has said, we have never seen an instance of life coming out of non-life. And that's a, that's a big thing to get over. But I, I think it's important what you're doing, because uh, Vernadsky, when he was confronted with this idea of the pool of Darwin, and life kind of coming out of the pool, he said life has to come into a biosphere. It doesn't come as a single event, it suddenly happens and then spreads. It has to come into a geometry in which it can grow. And I think what you have shown uh, in terms of the development of the earth and the minerals uh, is a very important part of building that biosphere in which life could thrive. So I, I think it's very important and thank you for your work. Thank you. Over here. Uh, Dr. Hazen, uh, this afternoon I was reading one of your papers uh, published in Astrobiology last year, and I was intrigued by the co-evolution you described um, by, by microbial life shaping uh, the geology of early Earth. And I'd never thought of it that way. I thought about early life being something just sort of clinging on the edge of a rock, but you made it seem more like um, it's a, a living, the planet itself, it becomes sort of a living organism. And I wondered if that changes the way in which we might search for extraterrestrial life. Uh, it's, pr it's profoundly important to understand the role that microbes can play in transforming a planet. It transforms the chemistry of the ocean, transforms the chemistry of the atmosphere. It transforms the nature of the near surface environment by creating weathering environments. Microbes not just passively do this, but they actively can dissolve away and eat away the rocks. They form clay minerals, they form soils that would not otherwise be there. Uh, when we look at a forest ecosystem, what you're seeing is, is not just living things on an otherwise non-living surface, we're seeing an entire critical zone that thrives with various kinds of life and the interaction between the two are, are critically important to understanding how our planet has changed. So 
So this really is a realization that, that many, many people, and this, this dates back not just recently, but people like Vernadsky and Goldschmidt and, and others recognized this aspects of this, glimpses of this, but I think now with, with new technologies to study life and study rocks, we're seeing that intimate interconnection in ways that we never saw before. So I would like to get to everyone, but please, please keep your uh, questions short, because I'm being pushed, we have to get to our reception. Okay, um, so I have a question for the NOVA team, and this can be for you as well. Um, how, could you share um, a little bit of your process about how you choose the topics that you're going to address um, sort of, you know, this year, next year, and so on? I mean, I think this gets back to the gentleman's question back here as well. Um, you know, I wish that I had a really formal process when people asked me so I could sound more intelligent and organized about this. And um, I, I think this really relates to what Julia said, that it's all about story. You can have a really interesting topic, something really interesting and really important in science, but it's a topic. And 100 facts about any topic, no matter how great the topic is, is not going to make a good science documentary. You have to have a great story. So we look at it, we look at the subject matter. Is it something that we've done six times this year already? Um, so we look at it in terms of its uniqueness. We look at it in terms of its importance for science. Is this something that's trivial, or is this a question that's really important? How does it relate to what our audience, I mean, we have 43 years of data on our audience. And although we will sometimes do shows that we're pretty sure the audience, they haven't necessarily, might not like because they're so critical, like climate change, it's really hard to get people to watch programs on climate change. But we do it, and we do it a lot because it's really important. And, and then the, the, the other question is, is there really a story that has a beginning, middle, and end, and some kind of quest, some kind of obstacle to be overcome, some kind of natural story that we can follow? And so those are, those are the, but they're hard decisions. The, John Angier, who was my boss when I was a, a NOVA uh, associate producer and production assistant, and eventually he was executive producer. And when I took this job, he said, Paula, you won't have that many decisions to make a year, about 25 on the, on the subjects you have. But if you make the wrong decision, you're going to be miserable for a long time. <laughs> so we really try to make the right ones. And you know that's, that's in. And I think usually we do. Um, but they're very, very, that process is probably the hardest thing that we do. Julia, do you have anything to, to add to no, that? No, I, I think that that's, uh, that's all right. We, I mean, the other things we always look at are, you know, things that shine in this show, great characters, great visuals. Is, the, is there potential for pictures? It's not a radio show, it's a TV show. And, um, you know, there are lots of things in science that do not have great pictures. I mean, this is really, a, again, a testament to Doug um, that he and his, his crew and his editor and his animator were able to produce pictures for things that you can't photograph, um, and then incredible photographs of things that you can. Uh, but not everything, not every topic, and not even every story in science has that opportunity. So. That's, that's, those are key things that we look at. The look short at. answer is we agonize over it. Yeah. I think we spend more time and more emotional energy on those decisions um, than anything else. And, and, and it's worth it because they require a huge investment of time and money. As, as an independent yeah. filmmaker, I would just add that one of the things that's very <laughs> unique about public television is there is you know, it, it's not just the story that's leading it. I mean, I'm, I'm privileged to get to work there with people like Paula and Julia who are always asking, how can we use the skills of storytelling to tell a story that's important, as opposed to a lot of places that just 
want to entertain you with a story. And more and more of the science programs you see out there are turned into kind of reality shows that are really about story, 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 and not about substance. And I think it, it's, a, it's why PBS is so important, is that it, it continues to push to say, how can we tell good stories about things that are important to us? Sir. So part of the story of science is also the controversies and the reversals. And this is maybe a follow-on to that last question. But how do you attempt, or do you attempt, to cover that? Um, did that end up on the cutting room floor, or was that not going to be part of the script? Um, because, I mean, any field that I'm familiar with, and I'm not familiar with this, uh, what we think we know with some degree of certainty, you know, we tend to be dumbfounded a little bit later. Well, certainly um, there is a lot that's not in here, and one of the great frustrations in doing these is, is, an, is the issue of time. And um, given the sweeping nature of this show, um, I think that th we had to, you know, we simplified more and more um, to make it clear. Um, you know, we've tried to uh, include a lot of different perspectives on it. We didn't ever, some stories rely <coughs> more on that controversy as a dramatic element to push it forward. On this one, we, we had another device for telling a story. So, you know, it was, and, and then we were up against the time. And so it is probably less about the back and forth on that. Though we do try to um, you know, cover the differences and represent different voices, certainly in the origins of life, we cover groups that we don't have them, you know, those are, there's a lot of tension between those <laughs> different perspectives um, on, on that, that major question. So we tried to include that. Julia, why don't you mention our robotic show that we're doing? Because that's really the epitome of the way in which science advances, sometimes through failure. Sure, well, so we have a, a show coming up uh, in February called Rise of the Robots. And, uh, you know, for, for those of you who may not be that familiar with robots, uh, this, is, this covers the attempt to build mostly humanoid robots, but robots that can do, can, that can take the place of humans, specifically, in a disaster. So there's a big DARPA um, robotics challenge to design robots that can go into a disaster zone. And the challenge for these um, roboticists is to build machines that can do things that we can all do very, pretty easily. Climb a ladder, get in a car, drive it, <laughs> open a door. Uh, and these are incredibly difficult for robots. but the field is moving very quickly. Uh, and so there's a lot of discussion about, well, what's going to happen in the future? And um, you know, this is something we're wrestling with right now in terms of we're just about to finish the film. And, and you see in this film more sighs and moans because, honestly, these robots are a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they, they all, fail a lot. They just screw they up a lot. Right. And um, it's, it's funny, but when you consider that, you know, that PhD dissertations depend on this and that mm -hmm. these um, people have been working for months, years, on getting their robots to do this. Um, and, but you can see the way in which, it's very instructive because you can see the way in which failure is an integral mm -hmm. part of this process. Sir. Is the reason why surfaces of rocks and minerals played such an outsized role in uh, the development of life essentially geometrical? Uh, in, in two ways. It, it should be easier for the right kinds of molecules to encounter each other on a 2D surface rather than in 3D. And also, many of these surfaces are textured on a molecular scale, so they might facilitate the right interactions. Do you see that as being important? Certainly, the structure and the texture is very important, but we find the most important factor is the electrostatics. The fact that atoms have slightly positive or slightly negative charges and molecules have slightly positive and negative charges. And the very strong interactions that result occur through the, the electrostatic and sometimes even the transfer of electrons and forming new bonds. And that's the, that's the source of this incredible potential that microbes take advantage of. 
chemistry rules in that, that realm. Thank you very much for all those wonderful Thank questions. We want to thank the Carnegie Institution once again, and I believe that there's a reception outside waiting for us. We'd be happy to answer any additional questions out there. You've been a great audience. Thanks a lot for coming.